Today we are going to delve into the capabilities of a mini PC equipped with a modern Intel Mobile Core Ultra CPU and Arc integrated graphics that we've seen in laptops and handhelds recently. And I wanted to explore whether it has the potential to replace a laptop or even a desktop PC for tasks such as gaming, graphic design, video editing and even 3D rendering. And you might be surprised by what it can offer, so let's talk about that. Is Hubwood. Mini PCs like this are currently experiencing a small surge in popularity, likely due to their utilization of modern laptop CPUs that are increasingly powerful and efficient. The GMK Tag K9 features Intel's latest Ultra Core 5 125H chip, so 14 cores and 18 threads, also found in the MSI Claw and some recent laptops including the integrated Arc iGPU with 112 EUs. In this case, paired with a generous 32GB of DDR5 5600MHz RAM, and it's upgradable to 96GB, and a speedy 1TB Lexar NVMe PCI Gen 4 SSD, boasting read speeds up to 4.5GB per second and write speeds of 4GB per second. This mini PC also offers an easily accessible second M.2 slot supporting up to 4TB M.2 drives. Additionally, the packaging of the GMK Tech K9 is impressively designed and exudes value. You can either purchase this so-called NUC box as a barebone for around $450 on sales or pre-configured in different versions, while today's tested unit costs around $620 to $650 on sales, including a clean and activated Windows 11 installation without any bloatware whatsoever. It comes in a typical knockbox form factor with around 12 by 12 cm with a height of 5 cm and a weight of 525 g without the separate 120 watt power supply. The used case is completely made out of light grey plastic with some black grids for the airflow at the sides and another air intake grid at the bottom. The port selection is perfectly balanced actually. At the front it offers two USB 3.2 type A ports and a USB-C Thunderbolt 4 port with DisplayPort support and the 3.5mm audio jack. At the back we are getting two additional USB 3.2 type A ports, DisplayPort 1.4 and HDMI 2.0 and two 2.5 gigabit LAN ports as well as the power connector. So we are getting five very fast USB ports and one could attach up to three displays. Opening up the K9 is straightforward with a lid at the top that grants access to the small SSD slash memory fan. And then you just have to remove four screws and you're inside where you could add a second M.2 or change the RAM to your liking. And beneath the motherboard lies the CPU fan with its heat pipe and the soldered mobile Intel Core Ultra 125 CPU. For my benchmarks, I connected the GMK Tech K9 to my two monitors via HDMI and DisplayPort, one being a 4K 60Hz display and the other a 144Hz WQHD gaming monitor. I also used a Bluetooth keyboard, a vertical Bluetooth mouth and an external M.2 drive containing a significant portion of my gaming library for testing purposes. By the way, GMK Tech also includes a high-speed HDMI cable and a Visa bracket which allows you to install the K9 on the Visa mount at the back of your monitor, which I wasn't able to do as I'm using a monitor arm for my monitors that block said Visa port. But before we talk about the use cases and the performance, I want to mention that according to my watt meter, the K9 only uses around 8 to 11 watt from the wall when idling and around 55 watt while playing heavier AAA games like, for example, Hogwarts Legacy and up to 88 watt when both the GPU and the CPU are maxed out. By the way, these values have been measured by using the balance mode. The CPU fan is always on and depending on which of the three performance settings, so they are quite balanced in performance, you choose in the BIOS, it can get quite hearable, maybe comparable to a non-gaming laptop under load. So my personal recommendation would be to use the balance mode as the gains by switching to performance mode are marginal if existent at all. While the temperatures can reach 100 degrees Celsius that way, the fan is spinning at a very high speed. But in balanced mode, the temperatures stay at around 60 to 65 degrees Celsius, while gaming at a room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius 
with acceptable noise levels. Quiet mode is indeed quieter and the CPU is limited to a lower wattage while, for example, the gaming performance isn't really affected. But Hubwood, why not just get a laptop instead, you might ask? And that's a good question. So what are the real benefits of this mini PC over a laptop with the same specifications? First, you're getting a hell lot of ports. Second, it's most likely cheaper if you already have a monitor, mouse and keyboard. Third, if you're using it at home only and don't need the portability of a laptop, it's probably taking less space than a laptop and can even be hidden beneath your monitor via the included bracket. While it is of course very mobile if you need to travel between two places where you already have a monitor and peripherals, as you can just easily carry it in your backpack for example. Furthermore, the built-in CPU will be able to use full speed with its maximum wattage compared to a laptop which is more likely to thermal or power throttle. And it's easier to open the K9 and upgrade the SSD and the RAM while you won't have to worry about warranty or breaking any seals or such. Now for PC Mark 10, I was getting a high score of up to 6812 points, whereas the very fast SSD surely helps with that. This means the K9 is very fast in everyday tasks and heavy computing. And if you want, you can download that benchmark for free and write your results in the comments. And I'd be eager to know your results and the systems you've tested it on. Now the SSD also allows the system to boot up in only 23 seconds from being completely turned off until Google Chrome was open and ready on a freshly installed system. In Cinebench R23, I was getting up to 12,938 points for the multi and 1,729 points for the single core score, which is pretty decent for a Core Ultra 5 125H compared to the other identical CPUs that I've tested so far. Though here, the lower wattage of the quiet mode is noticeable. In 3D Mark Firestrike, I was getting up to 6,590 points in total with a graphics score of 7,056 and a physics score of 21,328. For Time Spy, the total score was up to 3,211 with a graphics score of 2,886 and a CPU score of 8,890. In Geekbench 6, it scored up to 2,283 for the single and 11,573 for the multi-core score. And I was even testing Blender, which was working really good actually. You could even use the real-time preview with cycles activated, thanks to denoising, and immediately get an idea of what your scene looks like. I mean, depending on the file you're currently using. I was also running the Blender benchmark, and when testing the iGPU, it scored pretty decent 377 points, which is what a GTX 980 or 1060 on AMD RX 580 would get. And thanks to the 32 gigabytes of RAM, which also serve as VRAM, you could even render some more complex scenes. That's actually quite impressive. And I also tried some 4K video editing in Adobe Premiere Pro with the file of my Acer Nitro V15 review, which contains a lot of color grading, multiple layers, transitions, etc., which worked flawlessly. Scrubbing the timeline and real-time playback with color grading was no issue for the K9. Actually, rendering the final project took noticeably longer though, with 35 minutes and 28 seconds, whereas my regular PC with an RTX 4070 and a Ryzen 7 7700X only took 12 minutes and 49 seconds for that. It's also worth noting that the Meteor Lake CPU supports a lot of video encoders like AV1 up to 8K, HEVC, AVC and others. By the way, I was also running the Pudget System benchmark for Premiere Pro, which scored 3083 points. Now, there still seems to be no easy way yet to benchmark the NPU or Neural Processor Unit for artificial intelligence related tasks the Core Ultra 5 comes with, so I'll have to skip on that. And I also tested a bunch of easier and heavier games from different genres, so let's have a look at that as well. And by the way, these games have been recorded via a separate capture card, so there is no performance loss. But you'll probably see some screen tearing due to the recording, so just ignore that. Diablo 4 ran quite well at 1080p with medium settings and XESS on quality while still looking pretty good. I saw an average of 49 FPS with a high 1% low of 38 FPS. So that's really no problem on this little mini PC. 
Even the frame times were mostly super flat with very few occasional micro stutters, most likely due to some texture or shader loading when an event happened for the first time. I was actually playing Helldivers 2 on this very machine for a few hours with no issues whatsoever. You'd certainly have to turn down the graphics a bit, but at 1080p with balanced resolution scaling and low settings with high texture quality, I saw an average of around 45 to 50 FPS depending on the map, with a superb 1% low of 43 FPS, meaning there are no frame drops at all, and this was probably one of the smoothest frame time graphs I've ever seen. Elden Ring was playable as well at 1080p and low settings, with around 39 FPS on average and 25 FPS for the 1% lows. It's not perfectly smooth and it's more like a PlayStation 3-like experience, but it's certainly doable if you can take playing at around 30 FPS. And actually capping the FPS to 30 could be a good idea here, which might calm down the frame time graph a bit and avoid a few smaller stutters here and there. The same applies to Hogwarts Legacy, which I've tested at 1080p with medium settings and FSR set to balanced. If you're okay with capping the FPS to 30, you could even raise the texture settings to their maximum for even better visuals, as due to the 32GB of RAM, this would work perfectly fine. And that would once more probably prevent some of the occurred stuttering, while I would still consider it to be playable overall. And to repeat myself, I really think that they improved the game's performance by a lot compared to when it was released. Cyberpunk 2077 does work okay if you're setting XCSS to the balanced mode combined with low settings at 1080p. It's not a perfect experience for a first-person shooter, but overall it's doable I guess considering the circumstances. And maybe further Intel driver updates could improve the performance and the visual quality of XCSS. But I have to point out that it was working much better than when I've tested it on the MSI Claw with the very same CPU slash iGPU. I guess it really benefits from the higher wattage and the 32GB of RAM in this case. And last but not least, Red Dead Redemption 2 was looking really good at 1080p on medium settings with ultra textures and anisotropic filtering by 4 combined with FSR balanced while it's still playable okay with around 40 FPS on average and a great 1% low of 34 FPS. In my opinion, probably the best visual experience of today's tested games, considering it's only running on an iGPU. So it definitely pays out to use 32GB of RAM for gaming with iGPUs. And this is basically what the MSI Claw could have performed like if they actually gave it 32GB of RAM. Now, Let's make it clear that this GMK Tech K9 is incredibly fast. It's cutting edge with excellent features that cater to about 95% of PC users' needs. You can even do some basic gaming at 1080p, especially if you're fine with using FSR most of the time. Additionally, there may be future Intel driver updates that could further enhance its performance. If I had to point out a weakness, the only thing that really comes to mind is that it could be a bit quieter. However, if you're not a power user, selecting the quiet mode in the BIOS would already provide you with a pretty silent experience. You know, with laptops you usually have a lot more possible weak points like screens, build quality, etc. Which just doesn't apply to these where it all comes down to the price and the functionality and the performance. And if you consider it too expensive, you could also check out GMK Tech's similar AMD systems. Those may not have Thunderbolt, but certainly feature an even faster iGPU with the RX 780M. Also make sure to leave a thumbs up if you like the video or subscribe to the channel for more laptop reviews and gaming benchmarks. I'm also going to test a really cheap sub $200 eGPU solution with this mini PC very soon, so make sure you're not missing out on that. And that's the end of this video. Thanks for watching, see you next time, bye bye and cheers.